Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Kent Devereaux, president of Goucher College, and I'd like to welcome you all to the second in a series of virtual speaker events as part of the Robert and Jane Meyerhoff Visiting Professorship Series. This year marks the 40th year that the speaker series has been in existence at Goucher. And this afternoon or this evening's event here wouldn't be possible without the generous and continued support of Jane and Robert Meyerhoff Visiting Professorship and the stewardship of Mr. Robert Meyerhoff. So Jane Bernstein Meyerhoff, 45, was a distinguished Goucher alumna whose dedicated efforts to support this college, its students, and its community has created a lasting legacy. It was her vision to create the Jane and Robert Meyerhoff Visiting Professorship to bring distinguished scholars, teachers, and performers like tonight's guest to Goucher in the interest of advancing local and national dialogues on the pressing issues of our time. So we are very grateful to Mr. Meyerhoff for his continued support of our institution and his advocacies for providing a quality, innovative education for all. And I speak for all of us at Goucher in thanking Robert Meyerhoff, Rita Becker, and the entire Meyerhoff family for their generosity and to the Goucher staff who helped to make this event possible. So I also wanna throw out a special thank you to Luchan Lee, our Director of Global Education for making tonight's event possible and welcome any of our international students who may be joining us this afternoon, this evening, wherever you are. So this afternoon, I am very honored to welcome Frank Langfitt. So Frank is a prominent national public radio correspondent based in London. He covers the UK, Ireland, and other stories in Europe. Frank arrived in the UK right before the Brexit vote in 2016 and has been busy ever since covering the political fallout of that vote along with terrorism and the pandemic. So prior to his current post, Frank spent five years as NPR's correspondent in Shanghai, where he drove a free taxi around the city for a series of on the changing China as seen through the eyes of ordinary people. And much of his experiences were recorded in his fascinating book, The Shanghai Free Taxi, Journeys with the Hustlers and Rebels of the New China. So before moving to China, Frank was also NPR's East Africa correspondent based in Nairobi, where he also reported on stories in Sudan and covered the civil war in Somalia. Frank is a graduate of Princeton and was a Na Na Neiman Fellow at Harvard University. However, he does have a long-standing Goucher tie that we're quite proud of. Both Frank's mother and his aunt graduated from Goucher College. So as befitting of an NPR correspondent, Frank will be sharing several audio stories with us from Somalia, China, and the UK, then longtime NPR listener and Goucher's Vice President of Marketing and External Relations. Mm -hmm. Stephanie Cauldron will be moderating a conversation with Frank and taking questions for Frank from tonight's audience. So get your questions ready. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce Frank Langford. President Devereaux, thank you so much for having me. I wish I could be in Baltimore. Uh, it would be wonderful. And I know that my mother would really be so happy to see this. Um, she loved Goucher and it had a big influence on, you know, on her, not just as she studied history and literature, but also it did shape the way she thought about the world right after graduating. She headed off and spent two months in post-war Europe traveling. Uh, and in the 1970s, she took me and my brothers to Europe uh, when I was just 10 years old. And it was actually that trip. It was, was one of the things that really inspired me to become a foreign correspondent. So uh, it's wonderful to be here. And I'm sure she would be really delighted to see this. Um, what I'd like to do today, uh, talking to everybody, it's great to have everybody on, is, is basically since we've all been locked down in COVID for about a year, I'd like to take a little journey around the world and show you a little bit about the places that I've reported on over the, over the years and explain a little bit how a foreign correspondent tries to make uh, spring stories to life. Really, some of the stories that will be in the history books, some of the great issues that are affecting our time. And I'd like to just uh, take a moment to begin on this. And one of the things that I, if people ask me sort of what I do professionally, I guess I'd have to say more than anything, I'm just, I'm a storyteller. Uh, I've been fortunate enough at NPR and elsewhere to be able to live in different parts of the world and often try to find individuals that capture some big moment uh, and, and do it in such a way that hopefully 
people back in the United States will be able to kind of grasp maybe something particularly complex. And these are just a few of places I've been over the years. Uh, over there in the left-hand corner, I'm actually interviewing uh, an illegal gold miner in the Gobi Desert uh, in Mongolia. Um, below that, a Chinese rice farmer. Uh, then to the right, uh, this is Sudan. I'm not actually interviewing the cow. Uh, I'm trying to get it to move for a sound effect. I don't believe this was a very successful interview, if I recall. And then finally, this is just a couple of weeks ago, I'm still traveling during COVID uh, using a boom mite and things along those lines. I'm interviewing an oyster fisherman on his sailboat about the impact of Brexit. Um, I'd like to start off where I started off my career, as, as uh, President Devereaux was mentioning, in the Horn of Africa, where I first started working for, uh, you know, uh, working for NPR overseas. And I was based in Nairobi, and one of the places that I spent a lot of time was Somalia. And it was quite, you know, it was a very striking experience to go to a place like Mogadishu that had been through 20 years of civil war. And you can sort of see from these images the impact that that had. This was a war really fought between clan militias, but also an Islamist militia called Al-Shabaab that was trying to take over Mogadishu from a UN and US-backed government and turn it into a caliphate, much as the way ISIS did in parts of Syria and Iraq. And I arrived there in order to get around. You had to travel back then. It was, you could not go outside, so you had to travel in these armored personnel carriers. And you can see just a little down to the left-hand side what an AK-47 bullet does to bulletproof gla uh, glass in one of these vehicles. Now, I, like a lot of things, as a foreign correspondent, you do make things up as you go along. You're constantly finding yourself in unusual situations and trying to learn quickly on the ground. Now, if you know, this was my first day on the job uh, in Mogadishu. And if you know anything about body armor, you know that I'm not real. I don't really know what I'm doing because I have my flak jacket on inside out. So not a very auspicious start to covering combat. But one of the things that really struck me about working in a place like Mogadishu was not just the violence and the suffering, but was actually the people I met who I found to be sort of really heroic folks that made me really appreciate sort of the human spirit against all odds. And one of them I'd just like to introduce you to right now, her name was Fartun Adam. She is still around in Mogadishu. And she was a fascinating story. She had grown up there. And in the 1990s, she was married to a man who was a human rights activist who was assassinated. Uh, and then she fled to Canada. And then a few years before I came to visit, she returned and she decided she wasn't gonna give up on Mogadishu. And she started a program for teenagers in which they could learn vocational skills. And they could learn maybe to work on car engines or learn how, learn how to, work on different mechanical things to get a job, make a little bit of money. And the idea is she wanted them to have a stake in society, even as battered as the society was, so that they wouldn't join an Islamist militia. And of course, that put her at great odds with Al-Shabaab, who wanted to recruit these young men as gunmen. And so when I was getting, when I was talking to her there, I asked her a little bit, you know, what is it like in the mornings when these students come in to your vocational center? And this is how she described it. We wanted to help them, but at the same time, we are afraid. Then we have to look, search them, see if they carry anything. Do you have to frisk the kids when they come in? Yes. Because you're afraid they might have a bomb? Absolutely. And I asked her, you know, how long do you think that you'll continue to do this, given all the risks? Um, I want to stay as much as I can. We committed this work, we're doing it. And we wanted to make a little change if we can. And that was one of the things that I found of people in Mogadishu who had an opportunity to go somewhere else. They had the money, they had the passports, but they wanted to do all they could to make the change. And to this day, she is still in Mogadishu. She has suffered losses because of staying there, but she has stuck it out. And I found people like her inspiring and heroic. And uh, had I stayed longer in Africa, I would have loved to have done a series on heroes like her who were trying to make a difference in that city. And now I'd like to jump over to East Asia. And this is sort of a, one of the great things that I've enjoyed about my job is it takes me to such completely different places. And so there I was trading a place like uh, Mogadishu, uh, a, a city that was so battered by civil war, 
to really one of the world's great boom towns, Shanghai. And I arrived there in 2011. And these are three of the tallest buildings in the world that were actually in my neighborhood, just a few blocks from where I lived upstream on the river. And when I got, uh, as Kent, uh, President Devereaux was saying, when I got to China, again, what I was hoping to do was find ordinary people who would explain, and I could sort of, in their own words, how they were navigating rapid change, economic change, so social change, cultural change, in a country like China where things move so quickly. And I came up with this new reporting idea. What I decided to do was to create a free taxi cab service. And I was hoping to just meet people and just talk to them and see if I found particularly interesting ones and then maybe follow them and, and get to talk to them for stories. So what I did is I, I bought a car and I set up these signs. Uh, and the first one uh, there says, Mian Fei Aishin Che, which very loosely translate as, translates as free loving heart taxi. And the second one, the characters at the end are cut off is Zhao Shanghai Peng Yao, Yao Shanghai Sheng Guo, which means make friends in Shanghai, chat about Shanghai life. Now, I gotta be honest, I wasn't sure that people would get into a car with a stranger in a city of, gosh, at the time, what was it? Maybe 25, 26 million people. Um, but sure enough, as I began driving, I met all kinds of folks uh, from all walks of life. And what was really nice about this is I just got to know them in a very neutral environment where they asked me lots of questions initially. And then at the end, usually they'd say, hey, let's connect on WeChat, which is a bit like WhatsApp here in the West. And uh, the most interesting characters I decided to stay in touch with and uh, eventually do radio stories for NPR on them. Now, how, the way I got this idea and I mentioned this particularly for students who are on here, is I got this from my first job. In college, I used to drive taxi cabs in the summer in Philadelphia, where I grew up. And uh, after I got out of college, I actually could not get a job in journalism. I applied to 100 newspapers, and I maybe got one offer at best. So I slept in my parents' basement on a mattress, and I drove a taxi cab. But what I learned is driving a taxi was a fabulous way to get to know all kinds of different people from all over the city, and that often people, when they would get in the cab, would open up and tell you about what was going on in their lives. And so I say this simply because in college and after college, for many people, you have a wide variety of experiences. And I'd say try all kinds of things because you never know what's going to pay off in the long run. I never imagined driving when I was 22 years old in Philadelphia that I'd be driving not only around Shanghai, but around China in a free taxi cab. And so after a little while in Shanghai, what I decided to do was get out on the road beyond this giant city and get to know other aspects and parts of the country with people. So Chinese New Year is the largest annual mass migration in the world. Hundreds of millions of people go home uh, to see their family and they go back to the countryside, often much poorer villages. And so I decided to give a couple of guys a ride and, uh, and a, a woman a ride back to um, Hubei province. And to the right, uh, I guess, is Charles. He was a fact. He worked in a factory. And to the left is Rocky. Rocky was a lawyer. Both of them from small village. And Xiao Piao is Rocky's fiance, uh, who's on, uh, who was on the trip as well. And we drove 500 miles in one day through China. It was very tiresome. But as we, as the trip unfolded, as road trips often do, they really opened up and talked very openly about what they thought about the politics of the country, what their lives were like, their dreams were. And what was really fun too as a journalist is to actually just have a chance to talk to people, not always be interviewing, but just chatting. And also I played a bit of a different role. I was driving them home, so I was a chauffeur. Um, I had a, the best camera, so I ended up taking photographs at a wedding. This is, I went with, I took uh, Rocky and Xiao Piao to pick up their um, marriage license. And then because I had the biggest vehicle, I ended up being in the wedding party, driving people to the village, relatives picking them up along the way in the little villages. And so here's how we were greeted when we arrived, the, the wedding, arrived to town, those are local musicians in the Liberation Army uniforms. And then Xiao Piao made her way up to the house and you can see here, tons of fireworks, basically like an artillery barrage. I can tell you that, uh, Chinese people love fireworks, especially in weddings. And then the local entertainment was dancing aunties. Uh, throughout the uh, cities and in China, 
lots of middle-aged women getting out and doing exercise by doing all these dance. And at the end of the day, Rocky and Xiao Piao were married. And one of the things that really struck me about this story and helps explain a little bit why the Communist Party remains actually quite popular in, in China is how lives have been transformed. These two men that I met had, had grown up in very poor villages and were now leading pretty good lives, professional lives in Shanghai in very short order. And what was struck me is Rocky's story is he had started off in a small farming village like this and left at 18 for college and then to study law. And by the time he was in his 30s, he was working in this building in Shanghai. And it's the sort of upward mobility that is a part of American mythology, but really has been, I would say, supercharged in China during the economic boom of the last 20 or 30 years. And as President Devereaux said, eventually I ended up actually following Rocky and other characters, people I met through the free taxi um, for several years, even as some of them moved around the world, uh, visiting them in Los Angeles, Mich Michigan, Paris, places like that, and ended up writing this book, uh, which came out in 2019. Now I'd like to wrap up where I am right now, which was my last journey over here to London. And as, as uh, Ken said, I arrived just before the Brexit vote, at a time when no one knew exactly how it would go. And I'd just like to introduce you to one person who actually I met just a few days before the vote. And what I should have realized is he was a harbinger of things to come. His name is Tony Thompson. He's a butcher who had used to work in the East End of London and his migration had changed his community. He had lost his customer base and he'd moved further out. And he was very frustrated with rapid immigration into the country and he had never voted before in a national election. And he said, this would be the first one and when I asked him why, this is how he explained it. Actually, this is him scraping his mind. Got to stop the immigration, yeah? Because it's only an island. You know, you can only get so many people on an island, can't you? It's like the English are being pushed out to the coast. And the main towns, I mean, even Birmingham and, and all them places, it's not England anymore. A few days later, these were the headlines. An eruption in British politics that would then reverberate around the world five months later another populist Donald Trump would win the White House in the United States. Many people outside of the United Kingdom thought this would be an economic disaster, leaving the European Union, this enormous market, single market of more than 500 million consumers. Um, and now, in the last two months, Brexit has finally happened, and we're seeing the impact. And it's been very striking. Even though there's been COVID, I've been traveling, uh, doing stories and meeting people. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was meeting a man named Jonathan, who's an oyster fisherman. Because of new restrictions on shipping oysters to Europe, he actually hasn't been out in that boat of his for many times in the last couple of months. And he's thinking if things continue, because he can't sell his mussels in Europe, he's uh, going to sell that boat and retire. You know, one of the people that I got to know just a couple of years uh, ago was a flower seller named Rosa who had this business for 20 some years importing from Holland. And she too was very concerned about whether she could continue to do work and continue to operate after Brexit. And about two, two and a half months ago, I called her to see how she was doing. And she said she had that she just decided to give up and close shop. We had had our business for 22 years. And when we finally locked that door for the last time, it was very traumatic and sad, you know, just to just to walk away from it and think, well, that's it. One of the things um, that we're finding in a period like this where people are locked down, where there has been populist pressure around the world and some populists have been successful at the ballot box, pleading, basically pushing a nationalist agenda, is one of the things that's also becoming clear is that so many of the challenges that we face require countries to work together, even at a time when the world seems so fragmented whether it's COVID, working together on vaccines and distribution, climate change, the, uh, the main climate meeting will be coming here to Glasgow in the fall, and terrorism, to the, as this is image of these candles um, in Barcelona, a terror attack that I covered. And so I wanted to say also to students that we will come out of this to a different world, but there's gonna be a lot of need for countries working together to solve problems that affect everybody. 
Um, and even though this has been a really difficult period here in the United Kingdom, and I know in the United States, the vaccine is rolling out actually quite quickly here, and we're already beginning to see changes. Um, something I'd love to talk about in Q&A. And then the final thing, just to end on a more positive note, well, I mostly, as you see, I've covered a lot of very serious stories. Um, there are a lot of very serious issues that we face uh, globally. One of the things that's been great about this job is to be able to also share it with my family. I have uh, two, two kids and my wife is a veterinarian and we've had a wonderful time also being able to explore the world together. So thank you very much for listening and I really look forward to uh, taking your questions and hearing your thoughts. Frank, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, I wanna just remind everybody that this, the Shanghai Free Taxi, I, I would highly recommend it. It is riveting and I'm so glad that you uh, shared some of your pictures from that book because one of my first questions and one of the questions I think that a lot of people would um, ask is, um, if you're following up with anyone from the book, and if so, who is it? Is there anyone that you haven't followed up with, but you would like to know where they are now? I personally am so glad I got to see the aunties dancing and part of Rocky's wedding because that was actually one of my favorite stories from the book. So I'm just wondering if you can share with us who you may still keep in touch with. Sure. Or uh, a number of people I do stay in touch with, and it was very interesting because, as you know, obviously COVID started in, in China. And so a lot of my friends were first affected by it. And as China locked down very quickly, um, after a series of mistakes that, that allowed it to spread uh, more quickly than it should have, the government did handle it very, very well. And so uh, a lot of my friends, they all locked down. And as things got better there and they began to open up and they controlled the virus, they actually were offering to send me um, masks. Um, because they knew there were mass problems in the United States and here in Europe. But I also know from talking to them um, that they've been very shocked at some of the mistakes that have been made here in the United Kingdom, in parts of Europe, and certainly the United States. Um, and one of the themes of that book also is some disillusion with the West and liberal democracies. And I think that that only has affected them more. There are um, some folks that I know uh, who I can't really get in touch with, uh, I am careful to simply because uh, there's a little bit of monitoring and I don't want to cause any trouble for them. Um, but I am looking forward to being in touch with a, a number of these uh, folks in the next few weeks uh, to talk particularly about COVID and how they're managing. Great, thank you. Um, I know you mentioned earlier that um, your trip with your mother when you were younger inspired you to um, move in the direction of becoming a foreign correspondent, but how did you know? When was the moment in your trajectory that you knew that you wanted to be a foreign there, correspondent? There really was a moment. I mean, that's, I'm very fortunate. I can tell you exactly when it was. It was 1988 in Northern Guatemala. And I had wanted to become a freelance, I wanted to be a foreign correspondent, but I had no experience and no one was going to give me a job. So I actually drove to Guatemala. I'd lived in Mexico before in a village and I spoke some Spanish. And I studied Spanish intensively in Guatemala. And then I spent about a week for a story traveling with refugees from refugee camps in, in Mexico back to the villages that had been burned by the army during the Civil War. And I focused on one family and I traveled with them all the way, chatting with them, sleeping on the floor of churches. And I can remember when they finally opened up and told me what they'd been through and the family members they'd lost and how concerned they were if they could get their homes back because people had come and now taken over their homes. And just being alone at, I guess I was 23 years old and I spoke Spanish and taking these notes on my own and just the opportunity to understand what the Civil War had meant to an individual family and then to be able to convey that back to readers in the United States. I just thought, if I could do something like this professionally, it would be, it would just be fascinating. And I felt like I learned so much. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Um, so you had mentioned um, at the end of your, um, your presentation that you have lived extensively overseas with your family. And so I'm curious, you know, what are, what do you think are the unique values or benefits that that vantage point has offered to you and, and also to your children? Yeah, I think it's been extraordinary and it's worked out much better. You know, 
this is a very unconventional lifestyle and I was worried about doing it. The kids, uh, our kids enjoyed living in the suburbs. We lived outside of Maryland, outside of Washington, DC. Um, but I think what it's really made for them is that their perspective, they see the world through such a broad lens. And we've been able to expose them to things that they would otherwise never have these opportunities. I'll give you an example. In 2014, I was spending a lot of time at the democracy protest camps in Hong Kong. Um, and they had taken over a big boulevard in Hong Kong, filled it with tents, and they had brought this area of the city to a standstill, fighting for democracy there against the Communist Party in Beijing. And it was so inspiring to see what people were willing to do to get a vote that they felt that they had been promised, that I told the family, uh, I want you to fly down for the weekend. And I spent a Saturday night with the kids in the protest camp. And I gave my daughter, Katie, who at the time must have been, I guess she was 14. I gave her a microphone and a recorder and she went around the camp interviewing people. And there was this one woman that she met who said, you know, this is so important. I brought my child here to know this is what we're fighting for. And even if we lose these freedoms, he will have witnessed this, he will have seen it. And she also said, a lot of people in the West take democracy for granted. And I got to tell you, there was no classroom where my daughter could have learned a lesson like that. And if anybody ever asks her, she can say, I saw it. And so I think that's one thing that has made a really big difference is the, is the way in which they can make connections. And I'll just give one other brief example. We also have had a great time just traveling and seeing the world and seeing ancient sites. So a couple of, I guess a few months ago, we went out to Stonehenge, which I'd never been to before. And it was a special time of day where you could actually, you could get past the fence and walk among the rocks with a small group of people for about an hour. And my son Christopher was looking at it and he was saying, this is really interesting. It was, this was built in 2500 BC, the same time as the pyramids. Now my kids had been to the pyramids years earlier. And it's, it's fascinating because these are both burial sites, but one was built by slaves for a pharaoh. And this was built by farmers and these stones are really supposed to help them use the sun to follow the planting season. And just the ability to make those kinds of connections which I hadn't even made myself, I think was just wonderful. So they've gotten, I think, a very rich education by living in these different parts of the world. That's incredible. And how fortunate for them. I mean, who wouldn't want that experience for your children? Um, sort of along those lines, do you have suggestions for our Goucher students and other members in your community about how they can stay connected, um, you know, not just in a COVID time, but hopefully someday when things open up in a broader sense with this global community. Um, you know, not everyone has the benefit of being able to have a national correspondent take them around the world, but do you have any, you know, resources or recommendations for our students that they could use to help them feel more globally connected? Yeah, I, I, one thing I would say is there's a lot of great international journalism being done right now. The world is changing very fast and to be a, absorbed as much as possible. And also remember that while we're shut down now, we will come out of this to a changed world. And with change comes opportunity. I would start planning now. If there are places that you wanna work, if there are places you wanna study, if there are projects you wanna do, take this quiet time when you're locked down to start planning. Because I can tell you, I'm also covering the travel business. There is so much pent up demand. And I think that in some countries, uh, while there's been terrible suffering for people who work in person, the economies may come back very, very quickly. And so I think it's a great time to think about what, do you, what would you like to do in your early 20s? Um, and where would you like to do it? And do a lot of research and be ready when, when things open up to go off. And the other thing I would just say also from my own career, is take risks. This is a, you know, we're, we're all lucky uh, to have survived this. Many have not. And especially in your early 20s, it's a great time to take risks. And I'm so glad. I did a lot of things that uh, I was not sure I was gonna succeed. I was terrified, frankly, of failing on some of these assignments. Um, but I would really encourage people to take that risk. That's great advice, thank you. Um, so, You've had a front row seat covering so much of history. Um, I'm just curious, what are some of the biggest lessons you've learned 
uh, that maybe would impart some wisdom to our students and our community? I think, you know, when I look back on policy decisions and also the way history plays out, one thing that I would say, looking at the rise of China, which has been really one of the biggest stories of our lifetimes, and it is changing the world. And in many ways, it's a very positive story. Just as you saw from Rocky, my friends, I, I first worked in China in the 1990s for the Baltimore Sun, actually. And so I've, I have friends from the 90s whose lives were completely transformed by the economic boom. But I think the United States in some ways was not really prepared for what an emboldened and enriched authoritarian country might do and what the Communist Party would do. And I think that we're only beginning to come to terms with that. And as we think about the challenges that we face in the United States and our values, it's good to think carefully about what the US can do working with other countries um, to continue to defend our values. Another lesson from Brexit is that um, looking inward and appealing to nationalism, you'll pay a price for this. Um, it's already happening with that oyster fisherman mm -hmm. and, and her flowers, and it will be even more. And the United Kingdom now feels like a pretty isolated place, not just because we're an island in the North Atlantic here. And I think those are sort of two big historical lessons is when you make these big decisions, particularly at the ballot box, they can have profound consequences. And so you really want to study very hard. You want to go, frankly, to trusted news sources. Uh, maybe, you know, get off Facebook and go to places that really, you know, that there is trusted journalism where people are doing real journalism. That's another real big challenge we face now that we've never faced in my industry and also in terms of American democracy, the rise of disinformation, which is something I've been covering here, going up to mosques recently and looking at what um, Muslim communities are trying to do to bring in more people to actually get the vaccine who are hesitant to do so because of what they read what's on WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it'll be interesting to see how history looks back on this era and everything that we're going through politically and not just in America, but abroad. So um, maybe your kids will be the ones reporting on that. Um, okay, we're gonna take, I'm gonna take some questions now. There's quite a few that have come in. Um, so I'm gonna take some questions from our audience. The first one is, um, were the Chinese people who climbed in your cab and opened up to you at all fearful that their comments might be overheard somehow by government officials? And how freely did they feel they could speak to you? So that's a, that's a great question. Um, when I, people got into the cab, I did not roll tape um, in the sense that, you know, <laughs> Americans are uncomfortable with microphones. I mean, if you stick one in somebody's face. If you're living in China, it's, you know, a non-starter. So basically, I used the cab as a way to just meet people. And then once I got to know them a little bit, and I would get invited to people's houses, and I would go do things with them, just ordinary things in the city, to get to know them, they became much more comfortable. And then I would say, you know, I'm doing a story, uh, and I think your, your life is very interesting. Can I record you? And then it was usually completely fine. Um, and I just, I used the microphone and was able to record people. And then at the end, when I wrote the book, I went back with everybody I interviewed and made sure that there was nothing that they thought in the book that could cause them any trouble. And I spent a lot of time and also fact-checking with them. So in some cases, I actually read parts of the book to them <laughs> to make sure that they weren't worried about anything. And so that, and then that made me, when we published it, I felt comfortable like I, I wasn't ex exposing them. That's great, thank you. Um, another question, how long have you spoken Mandarin and to be fluent enough to drive a taxi? <laughs> so I can tell you, I would never boast about my Mandarin. I'm, I'm one of the worst examples. I would basically say, don't do what I did. <laughs> um, I got on an airplane uh, in 1997, sight unseen and flew to China I'd maybe done two months of crash Chinese. And when I got out on the streets, people had no idea what language I was speaking. It was very <laughs> embarrassing to me. Uh, I'm not, you know. And then what I did is actually, I learned from taxi drivers. Uh, in Beijing, there's this great rhetorical, um, a great sort of rhetorical flourish that they have where you'll ask a question in Chinese and the Beijing taxi driver will repeat it in correct Chinese. So you'll know how you actually should have said it. So it's like a free lesson. 
And the way I speak Chinese now is such that when people meet me in Shanghai or in parts of rural China, they're like, wow, where did you learn your Chinese? You sound like a Beijing taxi driver. So I learned on the job and I really wish many of my colleagues have fabulous Chinese, but slowly and bit by bit by study and, uh, and talking with friends and going to parties and traveling and reporting, I, I got better and better and I was able to, to communicate with people and work on my own, especially on sensitive stories. That's great. Um, so is for another question from the audience, um, we talked about what inspired you to have this career path, but is there one story that you still think of to this day that has impacted you personally? Impacted me personally. I mean, you know, there are, I guess I'll, I'll answer that in two ways. One with sort of a tough story and one with a, a more inspiring story. Um, I think dealing with people that I got to know who had been abducted by the government in China for protesting the loss of their homes. And one that was really striking is a woman I got to know, they have a thing called black jails in China. And these can be old motels that they've converted in which people are abducted to prevent, prevent them from going to Beijing and complaining publicly. And there was a woman I got to know who took me to the places where she had been incarcerated. And it was so haunting, Stephanie. It was a beautiful public park. And there were these little cottages that looked like Hansel and Gretel's cottages. And when you got close to them, you saw there were these big bars on the windows. And she took me back there one day and we knocked on the door and confronted her captors, her former captors. And there were even people inside and what was so striking is here was a place where ordinary people who'd already suffered under the system were being essentially kidnapped and held for 10 days or so. And everybody in the park had no idea that that's what these cottages were used for. And that was something I think that always stuck with me is there was a darkness behind the incredible skyline of places like Shanghai. There's a darkness and if you talk to people, you would be able to see it. On a more positive note, I will tell you one of the most sort of thrilling stories I ever did was in South Sudan. Um, during the civil war in Sudan, there was the belief people thought almost all the animals had been killed, all the elephants, all the gazelles. When people began returning to Sudan and flying over Sudan, they found out there were these lost herds, like a million gazelles. 5,000 elephants had hit out in the swamp. And so this was a wonderful story that they were alive and people had found them. So I spent about five days flying around South Sudan in a helicopter, helping people, uh, veterinarian and others, track elephants, park them and put radio collars on them. And this was a part of Africa that was pre-colonial. I mean, there were no structures, there were no people there, just animals. And it was wonderful to just be out there in a helicopter racing along with hundreds and hundreds of gazelles about 15 feet below you. And I think that was also sort of the, I just found that such a wonderful experience. And I felt like I was really going back in time uh, to, to another era in, in Africa. That's great. I, I have a, actually a follow-up question um, regarding the, the, the black jails that you, you're referencing. And, and that was a very powerful story in here. And I was curious, you know, the one story, um, I believe it was Fifi who was exhilarated when she, she pe the police busted into her hotel room and she was incarcerated. Um, I think it's Fifi. And she was, her quote was that she said she was glad because now she know what actually happens. She's got to experience it firsthand. Do you find that, um, you know, there, there's that mistrust that these things actually go on with a certain subset of the population that you met? I think a lot of people have no idea what goes on. I think that I would say that one of the things that I found extraordinary is the Communist Party has been brilliant in its management of information. I can remember Bill Clinton so many years ago saying the idea that the Chinese could control the inter internet would be like nailing jello to the wall. And he was absolutely wrong. The Chinese government has been brilliant at managing the internet and it has become kind of an intranet. And it's so hard. I mean, one thing that is a challenge for me sometimes to talk to my friends in China is it's so difficult to use different platforms and you have to use um, you know, encrypted 
I mean, it's hard to talk on Skype, let alone Facebook. I mean, so Facebook, of course, is blocked. Twitter is blocked. So many things are blocked. And so there's almost, while many Chinese know the country extremely well, there are aspects of what goes on that people are not that familiar with. And a great example is the incarcerations in Xinjiang of Uyghurs. I don't think a lot of Chinese know exactly what's going on there. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, all right, well, I wanna get back, that was a personal question. I just wanna get back to the questions from the audience. Um, so there's been some discussion that the rise of populist movements, including Trump and Brexit, and the increasing attractiveness of the Chinese state-centric model is a backlash against the integrated liberal international order. What do you think of these discussions? I think it's fascinating. I think there, there is, if you told me 15 or 20 years ago that the Communist Party would be vying with Western democracy uh, as an alternative, they didn't even believe that at the time. I mean, the leadership in China thought, we're just lucky to hold on here. They thought that they were, they were terrified. And one of the things is when Xi Jinping came into power in 2012, it was an incredibly ossified Communist Party Corruption was through the roof. It was, and they were really, he was right that they were at risk of actually losing power, no doubt about it. Um, what has happened, and I touch on this in the book, in the, in the time that I've covered China, either lived there or covered it, now it's about 25 years, is that the Chinese economic model has been extremely successful, far more successful than the Communist Party ever really imagined. At the same time, the United States in particular has made a series of policy mistakes that have been glaring. Uh, one would be the Iraq war. Another would be the global financial crisis. When I arrived in 2000, I came back to China in 2011, the attitude towards the United States had changed dramatically. The mishandling of COVID has only added to that. And I think what I would say to people in Western democracies is, you know, you will be judged by your policy results. <laughs> and by who you elect and the way they are competence and what they do. And the world is watching. And certainly many people, everybody in China has been watching very, very closely. And a lot of them don't like what they've seen in the last five or 10 years. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, have there been any changes due to COVID that you see that we should retain? Uh, changes for, better, for the better in the way we live, the way we work or the way we interact with the world? Hmm. So um, obviously everybody knows that if you, are, if you have a job and you're lucky enough to have a job that you can do from home, a lot of people are spending a lot more time at home. And I think the commuting world will change. I'm actually working on a story about the way COVID is changing, has been changing London. And it's hollow, you know, London is along with New York, I'd say they're the two great global cities on the planet. And um, when you're normally in London this time of year, any time of year, it's full of people from all over the world. It's incredibly vibrant and cosmopolitan. What's happened over the last 10, 12 months is London's been hollowed out. And I think you're not gonna have as many people coming into work, maybe twice a week instead of five days a week. Um, I think that with that, a lot of you know, restaurants will close. And I think more and more people, what I'm seeing among my friends, is a lot of people are moving to places where they really wanna live. And I think that it'll be very interesting how cities reorient and rebrand themselves and make themselves more vital. Up until now, they could be guaranteed a lot of people coming in every day, whether they wanted to or not, because they had a job to do. Cities are now going to have to be a lot more competitive and they're going to have to add a lot of value intellectually, creatively, and otherwise, I think it's be fascinating to see what New York and London do, but also lots of smaller cities. So I think the landscape's gonna be very different. I think for quality of life and for actually distributing more people around the country, I think that you'll see people, people are already moving. A lot of my friends have moved to Oregon or they moved to Montana. Um, they've left Washington and places like that, permanent moves that they had in the back of their mind. So I think the landscape is gonna look really different when we come out of this and it's not clear exactly what it's gonna look like. Great, thank you. Um, so what countries are on your bucket list for your next assignments and why? I don't know. I mean, I, I've actually, I feel like I've been incredibly lucky. Um, I 10 years in China now, five years in Brexit and covering like major moments. 
I'm not sure whether there's an obvious next place right now. I feel like I've covered some great ones. The next place might be someplace in the Middle East, but I've, I've been lucky in that I've covered Europe, Africa, and Asia, and I've lived in South America, I've lived in Latin America before. So I'm hoping to stay here for a while longer. One thing I'm fascinated by is Brexit is actually driving this country apart, and there's going to be a vote in the Scot uh, Scottish parliamentary elections in a couple of months. And if the Scottish National Party does well, they're going to push for an ind another independence referendum, which they could win. And it's possible, so I'm, I'm still very interested in the story here because it's quite possible that this vote in 2016 that was very close, that was meant to pull the UK away from the European Union actually ends up splitting the country after more than 300 years together. Yeah, that's interesting, thank you. Um, how are you generally received as an, an American reporter abroad? And what kinds of questions do you most commonly get asked? It, de it depends on where you are and the era in which, so like I'll tell you in the 1990s in China, and you gotta remember back then the Chinese economy was the size of the Italian economy. China was still largely poor. People were just amazed by America. Back then, you know, Bill Clinton was president. Uh, the United States was running budget surpluses. It wasn't at war. And people literally would say, how do you guys do this? How, how are you so rich? How are you not at war at this time? How do you pull this off? And Chinese were really, very enamored. As I mentioned, by the time I got back, it was considered, opinions had changed a great deal. And then here in the United Kingdom, we happen to have a studio inside the BBC, we have a long relationship with the Beat. And um, what I started doing after, particularly after the Trump vote, is I started doing a lot of BBC TV and radio in which I tried to explain American politics, which I can tell you was <laughs> And I would, you know, and sometimes it was like, the same conversation over and over again. But I ended up doing a lot of actually talk radio here at the BBC in London and doing global TV. And it's funny because in a place like the BBC, there are very, very few people there who are broadcasters who have American accents. So the bar was very low to be a political analyst uh, on America. And uh, they would call me in the morning and I would go on and try to make sense of things. And we would draw a lot of parallels between the election, of course, of Donald Trump as well as what was happening here with Brexit and, and Boris Johnson. Mm -hmm. oh, that would be a challenge, I'm sure. Um, so what are some of the skills that you developed in order to make connections with people across cultures? That's a very good question. I, a lot of it was, I mean, studying a lot, particularly in Africa and especially in China. There are all kinds of physical cues, for instance, like it's very old fashioned when someone offers you tea to, to move your hands like this and top them on the table. It was learning all these customs that were very, very important. Um, and in different, look like at a place like China, you should not be so direct. It, it, things have changed. It's a, it's a more direct society than it was 25 years ago. It's a much more international society. And people now travel all over the world. But back then it was to take sort of a very easy elliptical approach to conversations. Um, and here um, it's actually, a little different in the sense that because you're American and you speak English, they're very curious about the US. So it's very easy to engage in a conversation and then about 10 minutes in, they'll say, well, what's going on in America? What's and so it becomes very, it's a lot of fun because both sides have a cultural and historical similarities and, and roots, um, but have different systems. And Brits are especially interested as you would imagine in the United States. Mm -hmm. So I use it in, I just, I sort of adapt to the places that I go. Um, and another thing I would say that's really good is I ask a lot of just open-ended questions. I ask people a lot about their families. I just, I spend a lot of time getting to know people. I know that I've worked with producers who I drive crazy because I will talk to someone for an hour, hour and a half, <laughs> who I just find really interesting. And I learn so much just by chatting with people in their homes and, and where they were. Great, thank you. Um, do you ever feel a sense of conflict when it comes to reporting on stories in which the subjects are experiencing particularly hard situations and you not being able to help? And if so, how do you go through that? That's a great, that's a great question. Um, there are times where you feel like you see people in very difficult situations. Um, 
covering a typhoon in the Philippines and seeing the devastation. Uh, what I try to do is think, you know, what's my value? My value there is to tell stories, take photographs, keep put people's voices and their stories on the air. And that's what I focus on because that's where I can have the biggest impact um, is simply the platform that I'm afforded by working for NPR. Um, there was one case though in the Philippines, I'll give you an example. We never did a story. I wanted to do a story on this. Um, an NPR, a guy who listened to NPR, an NPR longtime listener, um, he had a friend in the Philippines who after this, who lived in the typhoon zone and had no, had no insulin. And he said, is there any way you could get insulin to him? And my wife is a veterinarian she was able to get this and I actually brought it in in ice packs and found him <laughs> amid all the wreckage of a village and was able to deliver it. And that's the one time where I felt like I actually was directly of some help to, to somebody that I was uh, covering. That's amazing. Um, how has social media impacted the reporting of news? <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's another, that's another session, but I'll just give you two examples. One is that Twitter has been extremely valuable. Um, the ability to see videos in real time and to be able to confirm that they're real, especially geotagged photos. And I can tell you that when I got back to China in 2011, Weibo, which is the closest equivalent to Twitter in China was actually wide open. And it was amazing the things that we were finding on Weibo. I mean, you, if there was a big event of someone forced abortion, people would go on Weibo and say, you know, the government, the local government has done this to us. And you could contact these people and do stories. It was astonishing. And I think so in terms of being able to get to stories and get to people who are ordinary people in the center of these stories, Twitter is incredibly valuable. But what we've also seen in the last few years is that um, social media has been completely abused to deliberately confuse people, make them believe in things that are not true. And that's the biggest, I think the biggest challenge right now that we face in, uh, in journalism. And I think also that um, democracies face around the world and we don't have any solutions at the moment. I'm actually in the middle of a story looking at just, as I mentioned earlier, how um, some mosques uh, north of here are trying to use the fact that they're trusted, that they know their communities and reaching out often one-on-one -on -one to talk to families and convince people to come in and get the vaccine. Um, in a similar vein, talking about platform, uh, how does being in radio versus print or television shape how you tell your stories? That's a really, really good story. I mean, really good question. I, when I was writing for newspapers, I, it's very interesting. I would focus on lots and lots of facts. And I actually used to work with a radio reporter in Pakistan, an Australian. We traveled in Pakistan after 9-11. And I would be asking all my questions and scribbling everything down on my notebook. And this Australian cameraman would keep kicking my shins because I wouldn't let people talk. <laughs> it's like, you're ruining all of this. Stop it. And now I know, since I'm on the other side, I know exactly what he means. I think what I do with radio is um, let people really tell their stories don't ask too many questions, let them go. And the other thing is that the power of audio is something else. So I found that a quote on a page is one thing, but I found that when I interview certain people, they speak very dramatically. Sometimes they don't have to say much. It's just the pause or the sigh. It's a very, it's a warm, dramatic medium. And ideally when I'm doing stories, I like to think of them as nonfiction radio plays where I'm just the narrator like, Thornton Wilder's Our Town, where I'm just helping bring people on stage and they drive the narrative. They tell the story. Um, so very, very different process. That's interesting, thank you. Um, how did driving the cab in China differ from driving the cab in Philly? And anything unusual that surprised you because it turned out to be the same? I think where they were the same was that people open up. Um, where I think they're different was so much. I mean, Philadelphia is, I don't know, it's a city of a few million people. Shanghai is the size of the state of Delaware and it's three times the population of New York and it's skyline dwarfs Tokyo. I mean, it's just, it operates at an epic level. And that's why it's so exciting place to work. 
um, but they were very, very different. I was a better taxi driver probably in, um, in Philadelphia. Back then we didn't have, I had maps, but I learned and people told me where to go. When I first started driving um, in Shanghai, I had uh, maps in Chinese on my phone and I read them as best I could. Um, and I did learn to read them quite well, but initially on my first one or two people that I took driving around, I got totally lost. And what's so funny is that people's expectations of a free taxi were so low that it didn't really bother them. They were just amused by the whole experience. Uh, and then I would eventually deliver them where they were going. They said, well, that was kind of fun. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever feel like you were in danger when you traveled? Yes, I've had three close calls and uh, I wouldn't want a fourth. Um, I, this is another story, but I was carjacked and briefly abducted in Guatemala. And I was shot at and murdered in Mogadishu. Oh, wow. um, those are two, there's another example as well. What was really interesting about Mogadishu is I was in what had looked, we thought was a battle zone that had finished. And I was with a major in the Ugandan army who I was very, very curious. And they had trench warfare in urban Mogadishu. It's fascinating. It's like World War I grafted on to an East African capital. And so the whole thing intrigued me. I couldn't understand it. So he took me through and we were down there and there was a sniper who started firing. And we got down and then, then there were mortars and we ran, but I ran tape the whole time. Wow. So I actually put the whole thing. I was interviewing while we were running. Um, I'm very good at running when these things happen. That's my response. It's just run and record. Seems smart. Um... So you've lived in uh, China and know that country well, and given the concerns about China's increasing influence worldwide, how do you foresee the US-China relations moving forward? It's gonna be very challenging. I think there are fundamental disagreements about values and also fundamental disagreements on how the world should operate. And China, in fairness to the Communist Party, this is the second largest economy in the world. You can understand why they wouldn't want to operate in a post-World War II order that was built by Western Europe and especially the United States. So I think there are fundamental conflicts here. And I think it's gonna be very challenging. I think what the, the Biden administration can hope to do is to work, find areas that it can work with China on things like climate change and maybe, hopefully COVID, although that's been quite contentious, but also challenge China on human rights issues and also what we now have seen in recent years, undermining values in the West. There's been infiltration of universities here in the United Kingdom. Uh, there are professors I know at, at universities here who now, and this I think is true in the States, um, are you know, very cautious about certain kinds of teaching. And so it's a, I think it's a very, very challenging time. Great, thank you. I'm just mindful of the time and wanna be respectful of you and your evening. So I'm just gonna wrap it up with this one last question. Um, what's the biggest lesson you've learned throughout all of this about raising kids from all the people that you've met? All the people that I've met. Um, I'll tell you one thing I found that was great in East Africa. I mean, every place we've gone, I think we've picked up some of the best traits of these cultures. And that's what I've really enjoyed. It's like, I'm very much an American. I love the States, I love coming home, and I consider it home. But as we've moved from place to place, place we're sort of we're with other strong cultural traits. And I'd say in East Africa, the incredible warmth and inclusiveness. When we arrived in Nairobi, the next night after we arrived, my daughter was next door with the neighbors having dinner. There are not a lot of cultures where that would happen in the world. And so every place I've gone, I think in China, I would say, I love the drive of the Chinese migrants. They're hustlers. And a lot of the people in the book are migrants. And I really, really appreciate that. Uh, so in different places, I think I've learned a lot from that. And hopefully my kids, I think, have as well. Great, thank you. Uh, well, we are at time. And again, like I said, I want to be respectful of you and your time. Um, and I want to thank you so much for your stories, for telling us, you know, sharing your stories with us in this format and also in your book, because it was really, really riveting. And I'm just really thankful that you shared all of your wisdom and experience with our community. So thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Stephanie, thank you. And thank Goucher. thanks to all, all the Goucher community for having me. I know that my mother is with us in spirit. Aww.
Thank you for saying that. That's great. Um, I, I, I believe she is as well. So um, thank you so much for your time. Have a great evening and we will look forward to hearing more from you in the future. Take care. Thanks. Bye.